Uh, welcome. Why don't, why don't we get started? Uh, my name is Chris Paxson, for those of you who I haven't met. I'm Dean of the Woodrow Wilson School. And I'm really delighted to um, introduce Dr. Matuli Nukube, who has come a very long way to talk to us today. Uh, he is the Chief Economist and Vice President of the African Development Bank, and I was introduced to him electronically by a Princeton alum who said, you have to have this man come and speak to, uh, to Princeton, so I'm, I'm glad that finally worked out. Uh, he oversees the Development Research Division of the bank and the Statistics Division and the African Development Institute, and in that role, He's done a lot of work. You know, if you look at the um, African Development Bank's website, they're involved in many really important projects throughout Africa, a lot of um, transportation, infrastructure, uh, trade issues, and, and uh, other issues that I'm sure he'll, he'll talk about, um, all of which are aimed at increasing growth and improving welfare in Africa. Uh, one thing that I'm particularly interested in, because it's something that I've heard a lot of good things about over the years, is he serves as chairman of the board of the African Economic Research Consortium, which you probably wouldn't know if you're not in academics, but this has been a consortium that's done a lot of work to promote um, uh, the development of economists in Africa and, and provide training and, and things like that. So it's been a very important um, institution uh, and it has been around a long time. Um, Dr. Nakube is chairman of the Global Af Agenda Council on Poverty and Economic Development of the World Economic Forum. He's also governor of the African Capacity Building Foundation. And in addition to this, he has also served in academia. Uh, he has been dean of the Faculty of Commerce, Law, and Management at uh, the University of Witwatersrand uh, in South Africa dean and professor of finance at Fitz Business School. So, you know, a great track record of academic service and public service and deeply knowledgeable about the development issues in Africa. So please join me in welcoming him. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dean. Glad you're here. Well, good evening, or oh, is it still afternoon, I think? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dean uh, Chris Paxson, and thank you for inviting me to, to the Woodrow Wilson School uh, in Princeton. It's a wonderful campus. The first time I've been here, uh, I, I went to Oxbridge, I went to Cambridge, so this is familiar territory for me, all the college you know, students cycling around, and I hope they get to class on time and all that stuff. So it, it feels like, like, like home to me. Um, I, I, I chose to, to talk about uh, a topic that is dear to me. Uh, that's what I also do for a living. So you shouldn't be surprised that uh, you know, Africa towards strong, sustained, and inclusive uh, growth. Um, let me see if I can, I, I can work this. Here we go. My, my, my talk is divided into uh, uh, three parts. Uh, the first part just is a brief history uh, of Africa, socioeconomic uh, history, and some progress uh, that, that we think is notable. Uh, and number two, uh, part B, we'll talk about the drivers of change going forward, certainly in the next 50 years. And part C is the policy response and strategies that we believe uh, should be undertaken by a development bank, the African governments themselves, and anyone trying to assist Africa. And, and these uh, uh, responses are based on the principles of inclusive growth. Uh, I, and I'll tell you what we mean by inclusive growth, at least uh, from where I come from. Um, if, if you go back to the, the 1950s, uh, I hope this is, this is why, uh, 1950s, you, I think it's fair to say that pre-1950s, up to maybe mid-50s, to the 60s, we had uh, 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 colonial governments in Africa, mainly colonial governments, and then we moved to 50s to the 70s, to the liberation phase, uh, a lot of fighting all over the place. Some of it went into the 1980s, but I would say, safely say, 50s to 70s, that 20-year period was the liberation phase. And then 70s to the 80s, it was more uh, pushing for, again, the command economy. You remember that was the height of the Cold War. It made sense to have Ujamaa in Tanzania, socialism in Zimbabwe, even liberation movements. They, they were, if you look at the economic policies, were built around a control command e economy. In the 80s, uh, uh, part of the 80s, mid 80s particularly, uh, to the 90s, we moved to the, as they say, Washington consensus, or the move to economic liberalization, the collapse of, of communism. In fact, I remember I was uh, I, I even went to a communist school myself in East Germany, East Berlin, in the old days, when it was East Berlin, two months before the collapse of the Berlin Wall. Uh, I went to that school. It was fascinating. I can tell you another story about that. 
And then in the 1990s up to about 2008, I would say you see the consolidation of economic uh, reforms, economic liberalization, and increasing democratization uh, of Africa. And, and, and 2008 uh, uh, onwards, with the onset of the financial crisis, I think that's where you see the positive impact of the, of the uh, uh, economic liberalization phase <laughs> taking effect because most of the countries in Africa have shown great resilience in the face of the uh, financial crisis. They came out quickly and it shows that the quality of managers has improved enormously over the years. Certainly if you look around Africa, the quality of the central bank bankers, whether it's in Nigeria, in Tanzania, in Kenya, uh, in South Africa, although that's always slightly different, across Africa, the quality of economic managers has improved enormously. And that's likely due, due to the structural adjustment programs uh, uh, you know, that took place uh, in, 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 the, uh, in the 80s. Uh, but, but, but really progress uh, behind uh, uh, the scenes, poverty in Africa it is falling. It is falling. Uh, it's not falling fast enough, I must dare say, but it is uh, falling. Per capita incomes are rising, uh, uh, but I, must, I dare say inequality is also rising. Inequality is rising. Inter-Africa trade is rising slowly, but not fast enough. Um, ICT penetration uh, has increased substantially. Uh, Kenya basically invented mobile banking. It's, it's an incredible story, uh, Mpesa uh, and, and Mcash and, and so forth. Uh, access to water and sanitation, not great. It's, it's not improving fast enough. Uh, there, there's a big problem there. Um, Agricultural productivity is not rising fast enough. I've got a chart to, to show you that later. Uh, infant mortality is dropping. Youth unemployment is a problem. Sierra Leone, Liberia, you do have a lot of youth. Uh, if they just need to be uh, led the wrong way and a lot of things, nasty things could, could happen. There's a mismatch. You have a shortage of skills in Africa. You've got uh, institutions that are producing graduates. The graduates are not, are not getting employed. Certainly the, the elite tend to send their kids abroad. I can assure you, the elite send their kids abroad and not in Africa, and that creates a, a, a curious problem of, of skills shortage. Voice and accountability is not improving fast enough. I've got a chart to show you on, on governance later. You'll see that this is the one area that needs to be, to be worked on in Africa. Uh, primary school education. I don't know who's a fan of MDGs. I'm not a fan of MDGs, by the way. I'm not, because I think that uh, we could do more than that. Uh, it's, it's focused, you know that there's that MDG that focuses on uh, universal education, primary education for all, but no one is watching the completion rates. The completion rates uh, are not as good as the entrance rates into primary school. We, we, need, we need to watch that. There's certainly a negative impact of climate change taking place uh, in the Horn of Africa, part of the, of the Sahel, in fact the Sahel region, the desert encroaching. We, we as a bank have done quite a bit to, uh, to try to stop it, to try to green that belt, it's not easy. I, I say though, uh, they say that the, the, the cost of doing business is falling. If you watch the World Bank, uh, cost of doing uh, a business index, that, that's improving. Certainly the time to start a business is improving. So that's a, just a quick broad brush of the, of the, of the backdrop uh, uh, of, of the, the progress in Africa that, that you see uh, to date. Now, I, I said earlier that the, the Africa recovered uh, uh, quite uh, fast from the financial crisis. He, here's the evidence. Uh, let me see if I've got, I know this has no pointer, so I've got another pointer here. Um, uh, uh, the green is Africa, you can see the dip to 2.5 and out 5.5 in about 2011. And you can see the, the big uh, dip there for the developed economies. Uh, certainly Asia, that's the China and India effect. Uh, uh, there's a dip, but not as, 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 a, as deep as the developed economies. So not, not as deep as Latin America. So, that that's Africa, is, this, is basically the second fastest growing region at the moment. But again, I dare say that the growth is not inclusive. The growth is not inclusive. It, it could be better. I've got uh, more charts about the different regions, uh, but uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna move fast. I did say that per capita incomes are also growing in Africa. It's not just GDP growth, also per capita growth is, 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 is positive. Uh, so, so there it is. Uh, but obviously below uh, GDP growth because there's the impact of the population growth, which is about 2.8% uh, per annum at the moment, and that's shaving off uh, uh, you know, uh, so that, that GDP growth. Um, that's a, a busy slide about which regions are growing faster than which regions. Uh, uh, basically the region that has done very well consistently in the last 10 years 
is East Africa. Ethiopia growing at 10% per annum for three successive years. Rwanda, Tanzania doing so well. Kenya not doing as well as the other ones, although that's the most vibrant, the most entrepreneurial of, of, the, of those countries in terms of the entrepreneurship of the people. And then you've got uh, the other region is pockets of West Africa. Ghana doing extremely well. In fact, Ghana was one of the probably the top five growing economies last year and, and this year. Uh, absolutely growing faster than China. And again, there's a resource impact there. That's, that's, that's having a, a, a positive effect. So, uh, Southern Africa, uh, moderate growth. Growth in South Africa is order of 2.8, 3%. Those are the kind of growth that you see in South Africa. If, if, if we get growth of 4 4.5%, 4, 4 we're doing very well. But the, the, the growth rate is of the order of that 3% and, and, and just below, below, below 4%. Um, uh, and then now the, there, is, there is North Africa. Uh, North Africa obviously was hit by the Arab Spring. I was there. I couldn't fly for two weeks sitting in Tunis. Uh, I enjoyed it. I'm, I'm being honest. I enjoyed it. Uh, because to see people get up and throw out a leader and he left quickly, uh, I dare say, uh, that, that was fantastic. Uh, you know, um, uh, and, and you can see the, the perfect storm. When you've got people who have no jobs, but they've been uh, to school and voice and accountability is suppressed. The combination of the two is, that's how you create a revolution. I've got a slide later to show you that you can see the unemployment among graduates in Tunisia was rising faster than the overall unemployment, and, and that's a, a revolution uh, uh, you know, brewing. So, so flood growth you know, uh, last year. Libya, obviously, any negative number will do, frankly, for GDP growth. Uh, that was a full-blown war, uh, and the other day I went into a hotel in Tunis, and in the reception there were all these young men on crutches and so forth. It was all Lib Libyans coming for treatment uh, in Tunisia because one thing that Gaddafi didn't do is invest in hospitals. He spread his money all over the world, all over the world, but forgot to invest in his own country. Investing in health, it just didn't happen. And, and, and you know, th then we got that. Uh, Egypt, a similar growth as, as Tunis of that order. Uh, uh, it relies quite a bit on the Suez Canal revenues. They do something like, you know, seven, eight billion, uh, those kind of figures uh, per annum in terms of, of, of revenues. Uh, um, uh, you know, it's failed quite, quite a bit. Uh, uh, tourism res revenues were also affected uh, last year, and the same will continue this year as they walk through those elections. Uh, uh, we expect uh, growth, uh, or rather uh, revenues from, from tourism to be the order of uh, 9 billion, down from something like $13 billion uh, per, per, per annum. So, so it's being affected by that. But uh, going forward, we expect recovery. Uh, certainly the political process and recovery in, in in, in, in uh, Egypt is going to be more difficult than Tunisia. Uh, that tension between the, the, uh, the brotherhood and the, uh, the military, which is really in, an interesting piece of tension, uh, is really, uh, that, that's what is determining the, the movement of things uh, politically in, in that country. Uh, yeah, we, we'll see. Libya, uh, what worries us is the factional fighting among the different ethnic groups, tribal chiefs, and all of that. Uh, that is producing a dynamic that might slow down the recovery. So that's a, a broad brush on, on, on North, North Africa. Um, now, I did talk about East Africa growing strongly, uh, being the strongest region. I'm not going to repeat that. Uh, I did mention that Ghana is one of the fastest growing regions <laughs> or countries in the world, 13.5%. Zambia, 8.4%. Eritrea, Mozambique, Rwanda. You know, uh, some of the not so great Libya, I've talked about Cote d'Ivoire. Is, is, uh, uh, but they'll be recovering Cote d'Ivoire this year. I think with Ottawa coming in, uh, certainly the, the economy is being stabilized. Of course, uh, uh, you know, Abidjan is, is, is more safe, but as you move out of Abidjan, it becomes uh, unsafe. I mean, that's the official home of the African Development Bank. So one day we'll go back to Cote d'Ivoire, but, but not yet, not yet. Um, yeah, yeah. We have to wait for a few things to come into place. And just, just globally, fastest growing uh, country in the world, Qatar, 18.7%, and look at Ghana at 13.5% in terms of 2011. So very high growth. The, don't underestimate the impact of the oil. That's the oil impact on Ghana, absolutely. And I, I tell you, Africa is going to discover more oil and more gas going forward. Our estimate is that we only discovered half. There's another half to go uh, in the next uh, 20 years, certainly. If we can press on, and, and then just some figures around the uh, uh, regarding uh, debt uh, situation 
globally uh, and then compare that to Africa just to prove the, at least to demonstrate my point that African economies overall in a macro sense are now better managed than you know, other economies globally or at least you know, 20 years ago, uh, for instance, compared to 20 years ago. Uh, look at Greece, uh, this won't work now. Look at Greece, uh, uh, this is the debt to GDP rate for Greece, for Italy and so forth. You've got about 15 countries above the 60% GDP uh, uh, you know, line, which really we expect that to be the kind of trigger point. Beyond that, then you've just have, have too much debt or the country has too much debt. Uh, so, so there we go, all the way down to Estonia, Bulgaria, Luxembourg, looking much better than Greece, uh, Italy, Ireland, and, and the US at uh, just over 100% of GDP, debt to GDP ratio. Look at African countries, only four, five countries above 60%. You've got Zimbabwe, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, Sao Tome Principe, and by the way, Sao Tome Principe, that is going to be wiped out. They've just discovered oil, everything will change. If the GDP uh, you know, numbers will look five times better, uh, and the, the challenge is how to manage those, those resources. Then you have Guinea, Cape Verde, and the rest are, are, are below that 60% mark. So maybe some, something right is going on there. So just a, a quick broad brush of what the situation looked like economically. Uh, uh, but going forward, what would be the drivers of change in Africa? Uh, I've identified four categories of drivers going forward. Uh, global drivers of change, physical drivers of change, human drivers of change, and the category where I've put everything together, private sector, democratization, and institution building. Uh, look at global drivers of change. Uh, it's got to be about a story about global markets, uh, technology and innovation, and then the changing rules of the game, uh, which is trade. Uh, looking at the changing structure of global markets, well, our prognosis is that uh, in the next 50 years going forward, 70% uh, of the global trade is going to be dominated by emerging markets, of which China alone is going to control something like a quarter by year 2060. Uh, is, is an example. There's a growing middle class. Uh, the middle class in Africa itself is growing. Uh, uh, you know, our prognosis is that uh, at the moment we've got uh, you know, 739 million people, at least in the G20 countries, that's the 209 figures, and in the next 50 years we'll have about 1.1 billion people, uh, and poverty certainly is declining. Uh, commodity prices will continue doing their, their yo-yo, but really the, the value of commodities is going to decline relative to manufactured goods and knowledge intensive goods. We, we know that. So really that's, those are the, the three drivers of change that we think are important in terms of the changing structure of global markets which will impact on Africa. Obviously this says something about Africa forming, having to form stronger linkages, what we call South-South linkages with China, with India. And I know the, the engagement of China and Africa is very controversial. We've actually done, just, just done a book on it. We can spend a bit, a bit more time on, on that. The other uh, uh, driver of change is technology. Already we can see the impact of mobile telephony, especially in East Africa, with M-Pesa, m, m -Cash type products, and those being expanded to the healthcare you know, uh, provision sector uh, uh, in, in Ghana. Uh, uh, but then we also see the, the role of uh, bio agricultural biotechnology, so-called gene revolution, uh, more innovations in the health uh, uh, sector, and certainly uh, uh, innovation uh, in, the, in the energy sector the movement to low carbon, uh, low, low carbon economy. That, that's, that's going to come through, whether it's, it's solar power, solar bulbs, wind farms. I mean, if you, look, if you go to Morocco, uh, we're already funding a, a, a project, a big, large project for, for providing uh, for solar energy, uh, solar uh, power uh, generation. And then in Kenya, in Lake Tekana, we're funding a, a, a wind uh, energy project where electricity is being produced uh, by, by you know, the wind turbines, uh, wind, uh, windmills rather. And then um, also in Kenya, in the Rift Valley, uh, we are funding a project for geothermal energy where energy is tapped from the hot water in the Rift Valley. Uh, uh, so the, the hot water, you, uh, technology wise, I think there are better people than me. I know that you drill a hole, the hot water gushes out, it drives something, that something then produces electricity. There's a, we drill another hole and take the water back and then re it's reheated by the earth and then you recycle it. So it's totally renewable energy. So those, those are the sort of things that will be more important in Africa going forward as Africa seeks to generate its more of its own, its own energy uh, because there's a huge energy deficit. Uh, 
changing rules of the game, some of the bilateral arrangements uh, between African regions, African countries, and let's say Europe and so forth, we think those will be impacted negatively and, and you see a much freer uh, uh, relationships uh, emerging between Africa and, and anyone that, that who wishes to trade with Africa. But certainly the South-South uh, cooperation will become more important in that shift, but eventually even that will, will, will open up. Certainly aid flows to Africa will diminish. It's not a good idea for Africa to carry on depending on aid. I repeat, it's not a good idea. Um, and that is not an anti-aid statement. It's to say that uh, there's a limit to which aid can sustainably uh, uh, deal with the uh, poverty reduction issues, the growth issues, development issues in Africa. Uh, Africans must learn to, to, and must make an effort to, to, to do more domestic resource mobilization, promote the, their own private sector. Uh, uh, certainly they can do, they can do that collect more taxes because there's so much tax avoidance uh, in, in, in Africa. Uh, and you know what? And also leverage the African diaspora. You have got about 35 million Africans that we can track in the diaspora. They bring in per annum something like $40 billion a year, which is just as much as all the aid Africa receives, by the way. Those are two are neck and neck. And we think that the diaspora remittances will overtake uh, uh, the, the, the aid flows to Africa. So, Aid flows will diminish, they should diminish, and, and other things must, must come in, in, in their place that are more sustainable and, and leverage of the, uh, the potential that's on the ground. Uh, moving on to physical drivers of change, climate change is, is going to be something that's going to drive uh, uh, African growth, African development. I already mentioned the opportunities around you know, uh, clean energy, solar energy, uh, uh, you know, uh, but global warming is an issue. It's an issue. It's affecting the, the Sahel. It's affecting uh, parts of Africa, Horn of Africa, and so forth. I've got you know figures here from experts on changes in temperature. You know, it's going to happen. Mineral resources. I, we believe that Africa has only discovered half. There's another half to go, if not more. Uh, there'll be more, more discoveries. We're seeing more discoveries in Angola, in, in you know in Namibia, in Uganda. Oil is being discovered. Uh, Kenya is also drilling and looking around and we keep hearing that they've discovered oil. There's just so much that is yet to be discovered. You look at the diamonds finds in east of Zimbabwe, no one thought that there would be diamonds. And easily in the next five years, Zimbabwe will probably uh, contribute a uh, produce about a third of the global diamonds, uh, uh, you know, just from one little region. So there's just so much resources there to, 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 to exploit in Africa. And, and the challenge is how to manage the revenues, yeah, which, which is very, very important. Um, I've already talked about the, the environmental uh, impact. Uh, le, 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 land and water is always an issue. Uh, and the, the, the big elephant in the room is the infrastructure deficit. The, the Africa invests, needs to invest something like $100 billion uh, per annum in its infrastructure. At the moment, it's only doing about half. And there's another half that goes unfunded. And this unfunded portion, about 50, 40, 50, about 50 billion, 45 billion, that kind of figure, is, is drawing back GDP by as much as 3%. So just by closing the infrastructure gap, that extra 45 billion will, will improve GDP growth by as much as, as 3% uh, per annum. But of course, we, we, we applaud the, the, the investment in mobile telephone. It's still part of infrastructure, uh, but, the, but the roads, the, the rail, the port system, uh, all, all that needs to be to be sorted out, and and it's, uh, but also not just the hard infrastructure, also the soft infrastructure. It's one thing to build a road, uh, uh, you know, on, on 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 the South Africa side, then on the Zimbabwe side, but it's another to have a, a well-functioning border post. So much needs to be done to invest in the one-stop border post to allow trucks and people to move quickly between the two countries. So there's a lot lot of work to be done uh, on the infrastructure front. Uh, I just had a chat to show you about the growth in the uptake of, uh, of mobile, mobile telephony per thousand inhabitants. You can see that really uh, it's been such a, a steep ride and, and by, by in another uh, eight years you will have easily uh, you know, well over a billion people with uh, mobile phones uh, in Africa very easily uh, uh, you know, all the way to uh, 1.4 uh, you know, billion in 50 years time. So a lot, a lot of people, uh, sorry, no, not a billion, this is per thousand inhabitants, so 1,405. Uh, right. Now, in, in terms of, of percentage uh, of the population uh, with access to ICT, 
in 50 years' time is 99, close to 100%. This is the one area where Africa has done very well. Uh, uh, you know, uh, so there are lots of benefits for this. I, I talked earlier about the infrastructure deficit. The one area that needs a, more, a lot of investment is in the generation of power. This is you know, the rest of the world, and look at Africa uh, in green. So you can see that in all the, whether you're looking at water and sanitation, electricity coverage, generation capacity, even mobile telephony, paved roads, Africa lags behind the other low-income countries, uh, and the, especially in power generation. In my view, if, 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 if I was any president in Africa, uh, the, the, the one thing that, I, I would just do two things. My manifesto would just have two things, is produce electricity and send, and send people to school. That's all I'll do. The two items of my manifesto, uh, because that's where, that's where the, the, the issues are. You look, you look at Nigeria, that's, that's how you, you, you fight an election in Nigeria, in my view. If you were to do that, uh, I think you'll be focusing on the right things. As a bank, we spend a lot of time mapping and showing you where the missing power lines are. There's a very detailed slide. You know, all the, the sort of maroon are the, 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 the areas where, where we think there should be more power lines. That's our job, to map the whole of Africa. Uh, you know, ports, we have done the same thing with ports. We also know which are the missing railway lines, uh, you know, missing roads and all of that. that that's, that's what we do. Um, uh, uh, just a little bit about trade in Africa. You know, intra-Africa trade is, 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 is very low order of 15%, uh, but let's not forget one thing, which is the movement of people and the movement of capital, which is intra-Africa investment. Those two are quite significant, they've risen sharply. Uh, uh, you know, if we ignore them and just focus on goods and services, then Africa comes out quite low, and I think we'll be missing a big piece of what's going on, which is, you look at the banks from South Africa, uh, Standard Bank, uh, uh, APSA Bank, or, or mobile telephone companies, MTN, and, and Vodacom, or you look at, for instance, the Togolese Bank, uh, EcoBank, or Equity Bank in East Africa. Uh, they're all moving in the region and investing. Uh, uh, the mining companies, that, you know, certainly the South African mining companies are all over the place. So that's not to be excluded when we think about uh, regional uh, in inter integration. Another driver of change, uh, the third one, is the human driver of change, which is the the first thing really is, is the demographic uh, uh, dividend, the transition of Africa uh, from something like uh, 1.1 billion people right now uh, to well over 2 billion in, in the next 50 years. Uh, uh, basically, the, the, the one continent that's going to add a lot of people to the world in the next 50 years is Africa. Just, just, just remember that. So that's both an opportunity, it's potentially a problem, if Africa cannot uh, create enough jobs and deal with the youth bulge, uh, uh, you know, we, that could potentially uh, uh, cause problems. Uh, but I should say that look, if you look at the growth of the middle class, I've done a, a report on the middle class in Africa, uh, and that, that class is growing at something like 3.2% per annum, much faster than the average rate of growth of 2.8%. Uh, and that, that is a welcome change. And if it, were, if it were doing a whole study on the middle class in Africa, uh, uh, how, is, how is it created, mainly through education, uh, uh, what, are the, what, what, what sort of activities do they engage in, the economic activities, they, they travel, they're the ones who send their children to private schools, they are also the consumers, and so forth. The sort of things that middle, the middle class do, and they're the ones who suddenly protest about you know, uh, uh, political issues that do not favor, uh, uh, or at least not in line with democratic practices. So, so that is growing, and that, that is a positive thing. Um, there's also an increasing urban population, naturally. People are uh, living longer. A at the moment, if you look at those who are over the age of 60 in Africa, it's something like 4% of the population. Our prognosis is that in the next 50 years, that figure will be closer to 10%. Uh, so that, that growing population of the, of, the old, of the older people will, will put pressure uh, on the economy. But it was also an opportunity. It means that something ought to be done about uh, launching the right services to look after the, the old, or indeed uh, provide them with health, with uh, medical care, health care, and so forth. Uh, migration is certainly going to increase. Uh, I see the African diaspora as an opportunity. Uh, I don't think it's a problem at all. People used to talk about the brain drain. I'm not worried about that. I think that's a great opportunity. We need strategies to harness all that, that, that energy. Literacy levels will certainly rise uh, from the current levels, uh, uh, you know, bit by bit, uh, it, it, it will be sorted out. Um, that's the population figures are more faster. 
the, the regions with the largest populations are going to be East Africa and West Africa. If you want to open up a consumer business, go to East Africa or go to Nigeria. Don't even think about it because that's where the largest population is going to be. That's where you are going to, you are going to, 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 to make money. The, the region that's not going to grow, well, Southern Africa, North Africa, those are laggards in terms of population growth. Uh, I certainly wouldn't want to set up my, my retail shop in Southern Africa. I'm from there, but I would rather do it in, in Tanzania or in Nigeria somewhere. And I know that I've got a growing uh, consumer base. Um, the urban population is going to rise from the current order of 40% to more like 70% generally. And maybe averaging 60%. There will be more people in, in the cities. That's consistent with the growth of middle class, but it will, it will put pressure on infrastructure or on everything that is, you see in a city is going to come under pressure. And this is where uh, uh, governments in Africa should plan, think ahead, realize the, the problem, because the young people are leaving the rural areas and moving to the cities. I can sh t tell you that if you meet an African who's, who's in my age group, I'm, I'm 49 years old, you know, you'll find that we've all left the rural areas, come to the cities, uh, our uncles are still in the rural areas if they're still alive. Certainly that, that what, that's what has happened in the last, I would say, uh, almost half a generation, or at least, you know, something like that. People are moving the cities, is, is, you know, and Africa is, is no different. So urban population is going to rise sharply. Um, I talked about the youth bulge, you know, uh, the middle class, I talked about the middle class growing in Africa, and that's a positive thing. Um, this is my revolution slide, just to show you that uh, youth uh, unemployment uh, in Tunisia, if you look at the graduates, uh, you know, it's more like, I think it's actually 30% right now. You know, uh, but if you look at overall, sitting at about you know, half of that, youth unemployment among the graduates is quite high, and that's your revolution just waiting to happen, uh, frankly. Now, more upon human drivers of change, HIV continues to be a challenge in Africa. Uh, uh, it is still a challenge. And there's one issue that we, we, we don't talk about a lot, lot, or at least have not figured out how to sort it out, is land tenure and access in Africa. 60 to 65% of Africans live in the rural areas, they live on land. The plots are quite small, unviable. And number two, um, uh, there's no proper land title. So you cannot go to a bank and use this as collateral. And that's part of the problem of trying to fix uh, agriculture and productivity in Africa. Unless uh, there's a, a considered effort to deal with that. Uh, I'm trying in the bank to sensitize the bank about this issue. We're not making progress. But if Africa cannot fix this the land issue uh, in terms of you know, property rights, ownership rights, I'm not certain that we make uh, much product, progress in dealing with agricultural productivity. Uh, in, the, in, the, in those rural areas. You see governments throw money at this thing by subsidies, fertilizers, and you know, all manner of inputs into the sector and so forth. Uh, it's, it's temporary. It puts pressure on the, on, the, on the public coffers. You've seen that in Malawi. If you've been following Malawi in the last uh, uh, you know, few years, that's what is going on. In fact, as I speak, the IMF is there this week and saying, devalue the kwacha. The president, president just passed away. You know. It, it, it's all, it, it leads to this uh, subsidy issue around agriculture, but the bottom line is deal with ownership issues, property rights issues. That's how you begin to fix uh, agriculture in Africa. I chat about what AIDS prevalence will look like, uh, move fast. And uh, I talked about Africans living longer. Uh, you know, that's a chart to show you that certainly living much longer. The, the, currently, the, your, your average uh, is, is about what, 55 years old, that's the average life for Africans. That's going to rise over the next 50 years to more like uh, by another 10 years very easily. Uh, so certainly the population of the older people is going to rise and that has implications. Um, just, just a slide to show you about, uh, to show you something about the incidence of, uh, of, of poverty. On the left hand side is South Asia uh, uh, showing you the, the impact on on productivity, uh, the productivity uh, trend over the years, uh, 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 yield going up in, in agriculture, cereal yields per, uh, cereal yields in tons per hectare, and then incidence of poverty going down. In Sub-Saharan Africa, yields uh, bumping along, and then you know, poverty not you know, falling much. Yeah. That's a slide. 
Literacy rates well, were going to improve uh, without question. Yeah. Absolutely. There's an issue here around science and technology. I don't think there are enough students going into science and technology at university level. Uh, uh, if you look at Sub-Saharan Africa compared to, let's say, to South Korea or Costa Rica or other OECD countries, uh, uh, much needs to be done to get more students into science and, and technology. The last driver of change is private sector and institution uh, building. Uh, uh, the private sector is, the, in my view, promoting the private sector in Africa is the only way to create sustainable development. I don't think it's going to come from aid. Even if it's aid, it ought to be leveraged to make sure that the private sector can, can benefit off that aid for creating jobs and sustainability within that, that sector. There's much, much needs to be done in supporting SMEs. I, I, I look at a country like Rwanda. They've done phenomenally well in, in you know, number of days it takes to start up a business. If you look at the Doing Business uh, Index, Rwanda done fantastic, but there are, there are no investors coming in. So, what, so what's going on? What's going on? Uh, so, so they need to think about how to intervene in, in supporting SM, small to medium scale enterprises, uh, such as you know, in venture capital finance, uh, 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 private equity funds, but targeting those countries specifically, within those countries specifically. Unless you do that, something really dedicated, going deep, supporting the, the emerging entrepreneurs, you cannot impact uh, uh, on Africa through reducing the cost of doing business and all of that the kind of old regulatory stuff. It's not enough. It's certainly not enough. Uh, this is just, just more information on the, you can see in the fragile states in, in Africa, what we call fragile state, 79% uh, uh, of enterprises uh, are, are what you call small uh, enterprises employing less than 20 people. And the more medium uh, uh, income countries, 55%. But there's a large percentage of, of enterprises in Africa that are small to medium scale. And the strategy to support these uh, companies is necessary for taking people out of, po out of poverty. These are just employment figures to, to show you that the bulk of the, 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 the biggest employer in, in Africa in almost whatever country you, you, you go to really is the private sector, whether it's in the form of small to medium scale enterprises or, or, or real corporates or something much more me intermediate. It is the private sector. That is where we should focus uh, going forward to make sure that people come out of poverty. Uh, this is just to really keep that the biggest challenge is energy, uh, electricity, access to finance, uh, com here they're talking to the formal sector, so they, talk, they complain about the competition from the informal sector. Tax rates, corruption, tax administration. These are some of the, the things that ought to be fixed uh, uh, you know, to support the private sector uh, growth uh, in, in Africa. But energy, in my view, is number one. Access to finance is another. But the, the way you deal with, with finance, in my view, is venture capital. I'm not certain that it's about bank uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, credit. It's certainly about venture capital. Um, we also did a survey to find out why companies in Africa uh, stay informal. Uh, a lot of companies stay informal. They tell you that getting information on what you need to register is still difficult, 23%. Uh, taxes on registered businesses, 25% of them feel that it's a burden, so they stay informal. You know, they say, no benefit from my business being registered, 15%. So, so the, the, it's, very, it's a very interesting chart to show you why companies stay informal. I suspect if you go to, to any country, any continent rather globally, you could find similar reasons as to why companies stay informal. So we have to fix all of these things to support that private sector and get people, uh, more people out, out of poverty. Uh, I know there was a coup in Mali and so forth, but look, you know, just look at the response from the ECOWAS region, the countries around there. They came in and said, look, this will not stand. Uh, it's not acceptable. Uh, we want you guys to get out. And I think, and I think some, something is, be, is, being, is being worked out. Uh, the world will not stand. Even in Ivory Coast, or the standoff and all of that, but eventually uh, sanity prevails. So it is my firm belief that democracy is taking root in Africa. Uh, uh, and certainly in, by 2011, last year, 18 countries in Africa were cons considered truly democratic. You look at countries like Ghana, uh, Zambia, uh, uh, certainly South Africa. Uh, though those are models uh, of democracy in my view. But I did say there's work to do on voice and accountability. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's very important. Yeah, here's a chart that helps. Uh, you can see the, the, the area where 
much work needs to be done on voice and accountability on this spider chart. Uh, a lot of work has been done in the quality of regulation uh, and so forth. Even the rule of law in the spider chart, you can see stability. Certainly, you know, a few instances here and there, but spreading out. But here, we still have a problem. Um, and there are benefits to regulation. I can tell you that countries in Africa that have, have deregulated or rather modernized their regulation are growing faster than those that have not. So certainly uh, that benefit is of the order of 2% in GDP growth per annum comparing those that uh, are liberalized and, and those that didn't, or at least didn't strengthen their, their regulatory uh, environment. Um, uh, what will happen to GDP growth in Africa uh, in the next 50 years? Uh, you know, it's, go it's going to accelerate much higher in East Africa and West Africa, less so in other regions, but will plateau uh, uh, sort of at about 5%. Uh, uh, that's where we think it's going to stabilize, certainly, uh, in, the, in, the, in the next, by year 2060. Now, uh, currently the GDP, GDP um, uh, size for Africa is something like $1.8 trillion. That's, that's the size of Brazil, by the way. So the whole of Africa is the size of Brazil uh, or Russia. So it's not very large for 54 countries. Um, but our view is that, you know, going forward, it is naturally go, 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 going to expand to more like uh, uh, 15 uh, trillion uh, and, and per capita GDP uh, will also expand uh, to the order of uh, $6,000 per person. But that's still below South Korea. And the current South Korea is about $17,000 per person per capita. Uh, Africa is 6000 So it's not large enough. Uh, so that's drivers of change uh, in the going forward, uh, and also uh, uh, what we need to do certainly going forward. Uh, the, the last section really is on, is on the policy responses, in my view, that should support uh, uh, this kind of growth, this kind of picture, or at least you try to fix some of the challenges that, that I mentioned uh, in, in part B. Uh, these, in my view, the approach should really be one of inclusive growth uh, and, and understanding what that means. Uh, I've got a definition here, at least my definition, uh, which is that uh, this refers to economic growth that results in wider access to sustainable socioeconomic uh, opportunity uh, for obviously a broader number of people within all regions or countries uh, while protecting the vulnerable and all being done in an environment of fairness, equal justice, and political plurality. So that's a, comedy, a definition of inclusive growth which I came up with. Certainly that's what I preach uh, at, at the bank and certainly whenever I travel uh, in Africa. So inclusive growth uh, uh, for us has a, an economic dimension, uh, a social political dimension, and a spatial dimension also between countries uh, in a regional sense, spatial, economic, uh, social, uh, political. So, so suddenly, uh, to support this growth, uh, suddenly to make sure that it doesn't falter, uh, uh, Africa must focus on the issue on job creation, supporting the private sector, better management of, of natural resources. Uh, I've been hel helping with some uh, noise in the background in terms of managing the diamond uh, resources in Zimbabwe, that they, they should um, uh, put in place a sovereign wealth fund uh, so that these resources can be managed uh, properly. And the Sovereign Wealth Fund will focus on three types of investment, which is uh, obviously recurrent budget expenditure because they need that to support the government uh, activities currently. And then secondly, something that should be you know, invested in, in infrastructure, a portion of that. And third, a portion for future generations to be locked away, but you draw down on the interest and earnings to fund current recurrent, uh, the current uh, expenditure. So, Sovereign Wealth Fund is something that I'm passionate about and I'm pushing them, uh, 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 their creation, uh, wherever uh, I have the opportunity to interact with the African governments. Uh, maximizing the South-South economic relations, leveraging off ODA for the private sector. So job creation and, and, and using all those levers to, to drive that uh, job creation is, is one way to ensure that Africa can realize sort of growth that I've talked about to earlier. Uh, in terms of infrastructure, remember I said that there's a gap of about $45 billion a year, but access to that infrastructure, whether it's water and sanitation, energy, transport, uh, is, is all very important. 
and certainly uh, making sure that some of the resources can be you know, uh, uh, harnessed locally. I mean, Kenya has done really well in, in launching infrastructure bond, bonds which are placed in the local market. The resources are raised in the local market. Uh, and they've been innovative in even using a, a Sukuk element in terms of Islamic finance. It's all those that creativity, in my view, bolsters domestic resource mobilization for infrastructure investment. A financial inclusion is very important. Mobile telephony banking is a way to deal with uh, uh, social inclusion. If you look at the number of deposit accounts in, uh, in, through the M-Pesa system in Kenya, the mobile banking, shot up, I think, literally in the last four years, from something like one million accounts to 15 million accounts. I mean, it's just exponential growth. So it's amazing. It's really amazing. Um, I think that works. Access to business opportunity. Supporting SMEs, uh, uh, again, I, I believe the way is really venture finance, to, to, to repeat my, myself here. And also we need to figure out in Africa how to create an entrepreneurship class. Or we don't see business people as people competing for power or as an alien class. How to support that class, uh, uh, get it to grow is very important, very important. And this is something that I, 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 time I preach about when I talk about Chinese, Chinese investment in Africa. I say, look, if you want that to be sustainable, find joint venture African partners on the ground, entrepreneurs to work with. Those, that's how you buy insurance, but also that's how you make sure that the investment is protected and is sustainable. You know, it really adds value uh, uh, going forward. Voice and accountability, much needs to be done, uh, um, but certainly a pillar of inclusive growth that we'd like to promote. Uh, regional, regional integration, uh, uh, investing in ports, in the roads, trade facilitation in terms of uh, 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 you know, one-stop border pause. But there's one issue that we, we, as I said earlier, we always ignore, which is the uh, intra-Africa investment in the movement of talent. That is something that should be promoted through you know, a common visa system, at least within a region in East Africa, in Southern Africa, in West Africa, to allow people and the talent to move around, because that's a critical pillar of integrating uh, uh, those, those economies and creating a bigger market. Uh, social protection and inclusion is very important, uh, certainly being sensitive to gender equity. Uh, women are the most impacted by you know, poverty in the rural areas, by climate change, uh, dealing with the old going forward because of the, the transition in, in, the, in the demography, supporting the peasant farmers uh, by giving them all the support, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, I did talk about inputs earlier, but if we can deal with uh, issues around title to land, that will go a long way in supporting uh, uh, the, the peasant farmers. Um, access to knowledge products is also something we should invest in, especially health and health innovation uh, systems. Uh, uh, I've talked about agricultural productivity, I won't say more. Uh, let me stop here for now. Uh, I hope I've given you a good picture of what I believe uh, are the issues in Africa, the drivers of change, how those should be supported through the principle of inclusive growth, and I hope that you as bullish as I am about Africa, because I am uh, uh, bullish about Africa. Yeah, it's a great continent for investment right now, and I think that you should, uh, uh, you should feel the same. And I, I, for if there are any students here, which I suspect there are, there are so many topics to research on Africa, a lot of topics. You know, so we could spend a lot of time about that, whether they're looking at political economy, how the elections are, are resolved through coalitions or whatever, the empirics, be, you know, around that political economy where there's deepening capital markets. There's so much to research on, on in the financial sector, which is actually my traditional research <laughs> area. If you're looking at regional integration, again, there's just so much to research on uh, regional integration. And I say well, one of the questions you could ask is why is trade in Africa so low? You know, that, that's a very big question, which is very uh, interesting if you want to answer it. And then looking at agriculture, how to deal with agricultural sector productivity. Those of you interested in climate change, the, there's a lot to research on in terms of adaptation uh, and mitigation and all of that. There's just a lot, of, a lot to do. Uh, Kenya is trying to launch a, a carbon market, trying to copy the EU carbon market, all those interesting things. Uh, there's just so much to do. I'm, I'm aware that uh, 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 there's an initiative also to launch a commodity exchange uh, uh, you know, the best commodity exchange in the world, in my view, is in Ethiopia. It's the best. If you really want to help you know, agricultural people in the rural areas to sell their produce, give them instead information, global information, take a look at that commodity exchange in Ethiopia, link to the rural areas. 
So many things to research on so for students. So I'll stop here for now, Dean, and I'm happy to take questions. Hopefully you found it interesting.